This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you could volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Withered Arm by Thomas Hardy. Read for LibriVox by Beth Peet at Reading, UK. Chapter 1 A Lorn Milkmaid. It was an eighty cow dairy, and the troop of milkers, regular and supernumerary, were all at work, for though the time of year was as yet but early April, the feed lay entirely in water meadows, and the cows were in full pail. The hour was about six in the evening, and three-fourths of the large, red, rectangular animals having been finished off, there was opportunity for a little conversation. "'He do bring home his bride to-morrow, I hear. They've come as far as Angleberry to-day.' The voice seemed to proceed from the belly of a cow called Cherry, but the speaker was a milking-woman, whose face was buried in the flank of that motionless beast. "'Have anybody seen her?' said another. There was a negative response from the first. "'Though she says she's a rosy-cheeked, titsy-totsy little body enough,' she added, and as the milkmaid spoke, she turned her face so that she could glance past her cow's tail to the other side of the barton, where a thin, fading woman of thirty milked someone apart from the rest." "'Years younger than he, they say,' continued the second, with also a glance of reflectiveness in the same direction. "'How old do you call him, then? Thirty or so. More like forty, broke in an old milkman near, in a long white pinafore or wrapper, with the brim of his hat tied down, so that he looked like a woman. I was born before a great weir was builded, and I hadn't a man's wages when I laved water there.' The discussion waxed so warm that the purr of the milk streams became jerky, till a voice from another cow's belly cried with authority, "'Now, then, what the Turk do it matter to us about Farmer Lodge's age or Farmer Lodge's new missus? I shall have to pay him nine pound a year for the rent of every one of these milchers, whatever his age or hers. Get on with your work, or it will be dark before we have done. The evening is pinking in already.' This speaker was the dairyman himself, by whom the milkmaids and men were employed. Nothing more was said publicly about Farmer Lodge's wedding, but the first woman murmured under her cow to her next neighbour, "'Tis hard for she,' signifying the thin, worn milkmaid aforesaid. "'Oh, no,' said the second. "'He hadn't spoken to Rhoda Brook for years.' When the milking was done, they washed their pails and hung them on a many-forked stand, made of the peeled limb of an oak tree, set upright in the earth, and resembling a colossal antlered horn. The majority then dispersed in various directions homeward. The thin woman who had not spoken was joined by a boy of twelve or thereabout, and the twain went away up the field also. Their course lay apart from that of the others, to a lonely spot high above the water-meads, and not far from the border of Egdon Heath, whose dark countenance was visible in the distance as they drew nigh to their home. "'They've just been saying down in the barton that your father brings his young wife home from Anglebury tomorrow,' the woman observed. "'I shall want to send you for a few things to market, and you'll be pretty sure to meet him.' "'Yes, mother,' said the boy. "'His father married, then?' "'Yes. You can give her a look and tell me what she's like if you do see her.' "'Yes, mother. If she's dark or fair, and if she's tall, as tall as I, and if she seems like a woman who has ever worked for a living, or one that has always been well off, and has never done anything, and shows marks of the lady on her, as I expect she do. "'Yes.' They crept up the hill in the twilight and entered the cottage. It was built of mud walls, the surface of which had been washed by many rains into channels and depressions that left none of the original flat face visible, while here and there in the thatch above a rafter showed like a bone protruding through skin. She was kneeling down in the chimney-corner, before two pieces of turf laid together with the heathered inwards, blowing at the red-hot ashes with her breath until the turves flamed. The radiance lit her pale cheek, and made her dark eyes that had once been handsome seem handsome anew. Yes, she resumed. See if she is dark or fair, and if you can, notice if her hands be white. If not, see if they look as though she had ever done housework or a milker's hands like mine. The boy promised, inattentively this time, his mother not observing that he was cutting a knot with his pocket knife in the beech backed chair. Chapter two The Young Wife The road from Anglebury to Holmstoke is in general level but there is one place where a sharp ascent breaks its monotony. Farmers homeward bound from the former market town, who trot all the rest of the way, walk their horses up the short incline. The next evening, while the sun was yet bright, 
a handsome new gig with a lemon-coloured body and red wheels, was spinning westward along the level highway at the heels of a powerful mare. The driver was a yeoman in the prime of life, cleanly shaven like an actor, his face being toned to that bluish vermilion hue which so often graces the thriving farmer's features when returning home after successful dealings in the town. Beside him sat a woman, many years his junior, almost, indeed, a girl. Her face, too, was fresh in colour, but it was of a totally different quality, soft and evanescent, like the light under a heap of rose petals. Few people travelled this way, for it was not a main road, and the long white ribbon of gravel that stretched before them was empty, save of one small scarce-moving speck, which presently resolved itself into the figure of a boy, who was creeping along at a snail's pace, and continually looking behind him, the heavy bundle he carried being some excuse for, if not the reason, of his dilatoriness. When the bouncy gig party slowed at the bottom of the incline above mentioned, the pedestrian was only a few yards in front. Supporting the large bundle by putting one hand on his hip, he turned and looked straight at the farmer's wife, as though he would read her through and through, pacing along abreast of the horse. The low sun was full in her face, rendering every feature, shade, and contour distinct, from the curve of her little nostril to the colour of her eyes. The farmer, though he seemed annoyed at the boy's persistent presence, did not order him to get out of the way, and thus the lad preceded them, his hard gaze never leaving her, until they reached the top of the ascent, when the farmer trotted on with relief in his lineaments, having taken no outward notice of the boy whatever. "'How that poor lad stared at me!' said the young wife. "'Yes, dear, I saw that he did. "'He's one of the village, I suppose, one of the neighbourhood. "'I think he lives with his mother a mile or two off. "'He knows who we are, no doubt. "'Oh, yes, you must expect to be stared at at first, my pretty Gertrude. "'I do, though I think the poor boy might have looked at us "'in hope that we might relieve him of his heavy load, rather than from curiosity.' "'Oh, no,' said her husband off-handedly. "'These country lads will carry a hundred weight once they get it on their backs. "'Besides, his pack had more size than weight in it. "'Now, then, another mile, and I shall be able to show you our house in the distance, "'if it's not too dark before we get there.' "'The wheels spun round, and particles flew from the periphery as before, "'till a white house of ample dimensions revealed itself, "'with farm buildings and ricks at the back. Meanwhile, the boy had quickened his pace, and turning up a by-lane some mile and a half short of the white farmstead, ascended towards the leaner pastures, and so on to the cottage of his mother. She had reached home after her day's milking at the outlying dairy, and was washing cabbage in the doorway in the declining light. "'Hold up the net a moment,' she said, without preface, as the boy came up. He flung down his bundle, held the edge of the cabbage net, and as she filled its meshes with the dripping leaves, she went on. "'Well, did you see her?' "'Yes, quite plain. "'Is she ladylike?' "'Yes, and more. "'A lady complete. "'Is she young?' "'Well, she's grown up, and her ways be quite a woman's. "'Of course. "'What colour is her hair and face? "'Her hair is lightish, and her face is comely as a live doll's. "'Her eyes, then, are not dark like mine? "'No, of a bluish turn, and her mouth is very nice and red, "'and when she smiles, her teeth show white. "'Is she tall?' said the woman sharply. I couldn't see. She was sitting down. Then do you go to Holmstoke Church tomorrow morning. She's sure to be there. Go early and notice her walking in, and come home and tell me if she's taller than I. Very well, mother. But why didn't you go and see for yourself? I go to see her. I wouldn't look up at her if she were to pass my window this instant. She was with Mr. Lodge, of course. What did he say or do? Just the same as usual. Took no notice of you? None. Next day the mother put a clean shirt on the boy, and started him off for Holmstoke Church. He reached the ancient little pile when the door was just being opened, and he was the first to enter. Taking his seat by the font, he watched all the parishioners file in. The well-to-do farmer Lodge came nearly last, and his young wife, who accompanied him, walked up the aisle with a shyness natural to a modest woman, who had thus appeared for the first time. As all other eyes were fixed upon her, the youth's stare was not noticed now. When he reached home, his mother said, Well, before he had entered the room. She's not tall. She's rather short, he replied. Ah, said his mother, with satisfaction. But she's very pretty. Very. In fact, she's lovely. The youthful freshness of the yeoman's wife had evidently made an impression even on the somewhat hard nature of the boy. 
"'That's all I want to hear,' his mother said quickly. "'Now spread the tablecloth. "'The hair you caught is very tender, "'but mind that nobody catches you. "'You never told me what sort of hands she had. "'I never seen him. "'She never took off her gloves. "'What did she wear this morning? "'A white bonnet and silver-colored gown. "'It whooed and whistled so loud when it rubbed against the pews "'that the lady colored up even more than ever for very shame at the noise "'and pulled it in to keep it from touching. "'But when she pushed into her seat, it whooed more than ever.' Mr. Lodge, he seemed pleased, and his waistcoat stuck out, and his great golden seals hung like a lord's, but she seemed to wish her noisy gown anywhere but on her. Not she. However, that will do now. These descriptions of the newly married couple were continued from time to time by the boy at his mother's request, after any chance encounter he had with them. But Rhoda Brooke, though she might easily have seen young Mrs. Lodge for herself by walking a couple of miles, would never attempt an excursion towards the quarter where the farmhouse lay. Neither did she, at the daily milking in the dairyman's yard on the Lodge's outlying second farm, ever speak to the subject of the recent marriage. The dairyman, who rented the cows of the Lodge, and knew perfectly the tall milkmaid's history, with manly kindness always kept the gossip in the cow barton from annoying Rhoda but the atmosphere thereabout was full of the subject during the first days of Mrs. Lodge's arrival, and from her boy's description and the casual words of the other milkers, Rhoda Brooke could raise a mental image of the unconscious Mrs. Lodge that was realistic as a photograph. CHAPTER Three, A VISION One night, two or three weeks after the bridal return, when the boy was gone to bed, Rhoda sat a long time over the turf ashes that she had raked out in front of her to extinguish them. She contemplated so intently the new wife, as presented to her in the mind's eye over the embers, that she forgot the lapse of time. At last, wearied with her day's work, she too retired. But the figure which had occupied her so much during this and the previous days was not to be banished at night. For the first time Gertrude Lodge visited the supplanted woman in her dreams— Rhoda Brooke dreamed, since her assertion that she really saw before falling asleep was not to be believed, that the young wife, in the pale silk dress and white bonnet, but with features shockingly distorted and wrinkled as by age, was sitting upon her chest as she lay. The pressure of Mrs. Lodge's person grew heavier, the blue eyes peered cruelly into her face, and then the figure thrust forward its left hand mockingly, so as to make the wedding ring it wore glitter in Rhoda's eyes. Maddened mentally, and nearly suffocated by pressure, the sleeper struggled. The incubus, still regarding her, withdrew to the foot of the bed, only, however, to come forward by degrees, resume her seat, and flash her left hand as before. Gasping for breath, Rhoda, in a last desperate effort, swung out her right hand, seized the confronting spectre by his obtrusive left arm, and whirled it backward to the floor, starting up herself as she did so with a low cry. Oh, merciful heaven, she cried, sitting on the edge of the bed in a cold sweat. That was not a dream. She was here. She could feel her antagonist's arm within her grasp even now, the very flesh and bone of it as it seemed. She looked on the floor whither she had whirled the spectre, but there was nothing to be seen. Rhoda Brooke slept no more that night, and when she went milking at the next dawn they noticed how pale and haggard she looked. The milk that she drew quivered into the pail, her hand had not calmed even yet, and still retained the feel of the arm. She came home to breakfast as wearily as if it had been supper-time. "'What was that noise in your chimmer, mother, last night?' said her son. "'You fell off the bed, surely. "'Did you hear anything fall? "'At what time? "'Just when the clock struck two. She could not explain, and when the meal was done, she went silently about her housework, the boy assisting her for he hated going afield in the farms, and she indulged his reluctance. Between eleven and twelve the garden gate clicked, and she lifted her eyes to the window. At the bottom of the garden, within the gate, stood the woman of her vision. Rhoda seemed transfixed. "'Ah, she said she would come!' exclaimed the boy, also observing her. "'Said so. When? How does she know us?' "'I have seen and spoken to her. I talked to her yesterday.' "'I told you,' said the mother, flushing indignantly, "'never to speak to anybody in that house or go near the place. "'I did not speak to her till she spoke to me, "'and I did not go near the place. "'I met her in the road. "'What did you tell her?' "'Nothing.' "'She said, "'Are you the poor boy who had to bring the heavy load for market?' 
and she looked at my boots and said they would not keep my feet dry if it came on wet because they were so cracked. I told her I lived with my mother and we had enough to do to keep ourselves and that's how it was. And she said then, I'll come and bring you some better boots and see your mother. She gives away things to other folks in the meads besides us. Mrs. Lodge was by this time close to the door, not in her silk, as Rhoda had seen her in the bedchamber, but in a morning hat and a gown of common light material, which became her better than silk. On her arm she carried a basket. The impression remaining from the night's experience was still strong. Brooke had almost expected to see the wrinkles, the scorn, and the cruelty on her visitor's face. She would have escaped an interview had escape been possible. There was, however, no back door to the cottage, and in an instant the boy had lifted the latch to Mrs. Lodge's gentle knock. "'I see I have come to the right house,' said she, glancing at the lad and smiling, "'but I was not sure till you opened the door.' The figure and action were those of the phantom, but her voice was so indescribably sweet, her glance so winning, her smile so tender, so unlike that of Rhoda's midnight visitant, that the latter could hardly believe the evidence of her senses. She was truly glad that she had not hid it away in sheer reversion, as she had been inclined to do. In her basket, Mrs. Lodge brought the pair of boots that she had promised to the boy, and other useful articles. At these proofs of a kindly feeling towards her and hers, Rhoda's heart reproached her bitterly. This innocent young thing should have her blessing and not her curse. When she left them, a light seemed to have gone from the dwelling. Two days later she came again to know if the boots were fitted, and less than a fortnight after that Ro paid Rhoda another call. On this occasion the boy was absent. "'I walk a good deal,' said Mrs. Lodge, "'and your house is the nearest outside her own parish. I hope you are well. You don't look quite well.' Rhoda said she was well enough, and indeed, though the paler of the two, there was more of the strength that endures in her well-defined features and large frame than in the soft-cheeked young woman before her. The conversation became quite confidential as regarded their powers and weaknesses, and when Mrs. Lodge was leaving, Rhoda said, "'I hope you will find this air agree with you, madam, and not suffer from the damp of the water-meads.' The younger one replied that there was not much doubt of it, her general health being usually good. "'Though now you remind me,' she added, "'I have one little ailment that which puzzles me. It's nothing serious, but I cannot make it out.' She uncovered her left hand and arm, and their outline confronted Rhoda's gaze as the exact original of the limb she had beheld and seized in her dream. Upon the pink round surface of the arm were faint marks of an unhealthy colour, as if produced by a rough grasp. Rhoda's eyes became riveted on the discolorations. She fancied that she discerned in them the shape of her own four fingers. "'How did it happen?' she said mechanically. "'I cannot tell,' replied Mrs. Lodge, shaking her head. "'One night, when I was sound asleep, dreaming I was away in some strange place, "'a pain suddenly shot into my arm there, and was so keen as to awaken me. "'I must have struck it in the daytime, I suppose, though I don't remember doing so,' she added, laughing. "'I tell my dear husband that it looks just as if he had flown into a rage and struck me there. "'Oh, I dare say it will soon disappear. "'Ha, ha, ha! Yes, on what night did it come?' Mrs. Lodge considered and said it would be a fortnight ago on the morrow. When I awoke I could not remember where I was, she added, till the clock striking two reminded me. She had named the night and the hour of Rhoda's spectral encounter, and Brooke felt like a guilty thing. The artless disclosure startled her, and she did not reason on the freaks of coincidence, and all the scenery of that ghastly night returned with double vividness to her mind. Oh, can it be? she said to herself when her visitor had departed, that I exercise a malignant power over people against my will? She knew that she had been slyly called a witch since her fall, but never having understood why that particular stigma had been attached to her, it had passed disregarded. Could this be the explanation, and had such things as this ever happened before? Chapter 4 A Suggestion the summer drew on, and Rhoda Brooke almost dreaded to meet Mrs. Lodge again, notwithstanding that her feeling for the young wife amounted well nigh to affection. Something in her own individuality seemed to convict Rhoda of crime. Yet a fatality sometimes would direct the steps of the latter to the outskirts of Holmstoke whenever she left her house for any other purpose than her daily work, and hence it happened that their next encounter was out of doors. Rhoda could not avoid the subject which had so mystified her, and after the first few words she stammered, "'I hope you are 
arm is well again, ma'am? She had perceived with consternation that Gertrude Large carried her left arm stiffly. No, it is not quite well. Indeed, it is no better at all. It is rather worse. It pains me dreadfully sometimes. Perhaps you had better go to a doctor, ma'am. She replied that she had already seen a doctor. Her husband had insisted upon her going to one. But the surgeon had not seemed to understand the afflicted limb at all. He told her to bathe it in hot water, and she had bathed it, but the treatment had done no good. "'Will you let me see it?' said the milkwoman. Mrs. Lodge pushed up her sleeve and disclosed the place, which was a few inches above the wrist. As soon as Rhoda Brooks saw it, she could hardly preserve her composure. There was nothing of the nature of a wound, but the arm at that point had a shriveled look, and the outline of the four fingers appeared more distinct than at the former time. Moreover, she fancied that they were imprinted in precisely the relative position of her clutch upon the arm in the trance, the first finger towards Gertrude's wrist and the fourth towards her elbow. What the impress resembled seemed to have struck Gertrude herself since their last meeting. "'It almost looks like finger-marks,' she said, adding with a faint laugh. "'My husband says it is as if some witch or the devil himself has taken hold of me there and blasted the flesh.' Rhoda shivered. "'That's fancy,' she said hurriedly. "'I wouldn't mind it if I were you.' "'I shouldn't so much mind it,' said the younger, with hesitation. "'If if I hadn't a notion that it makes my husband dislike me, no, love me less. "'Men think so much of personal appearance.' "'Some do. He for one.' "'Yes, and he was very proud of mine at first. "'Keep your arm covered it from his sight. Uh, "'He knows a disfigurement is there.' She tried to hide the tears that filled her eyes. Well, ma'am, I earnestly hope it will go away soon. And so the milkwoman's mind was changed anew to the subject by a horrid sort of spell as she returned home. The sense of having been guilty of an act of malignity increased, affected as she might to ridicule her superstition. In her secret heart, Rhoda did not altogether object to a slight diminution of her successor's beauty, by whatever means it had come about but she did not wish to inflict upon her physical pain, for though this pretty young woman had rendered impossible any reparation which Lodge might have made Rhoda for his past conduct, everything like resentment at the unconscious usurpation had quite passed away from the elder's mind. If the sweet and kindly Gertrude Lodge only knew of the scene of the bedchamber, what would she think? Not to inform her of it seemed treachery in the presence of her friendliness, but tell she could not of her own accord, neither could she devise a remedy. She mused upon the matter the greater part of the night, and the next day, after the morning milking, set out to obtain another glimpse of Gertrude Lodge if she could, being held to her by a gruesome fascination. By watching the house from a distance, the milkmaid was presently able to discern the farmer's wife in a ride she was taking alone, probably to join her husband in some distant field. Mrs. Lodge perceived her, and cantered in her direction. "'Good morning, Rhoda,' Gertrude said when she had come up. I was going to call. Rhoda noticed that Mrs. Lodge held the reins with some difficulty. I hope the bad arm, said Rhoda. They tell me there is possibly one way by which I might be able to find out the cause, and so perhaps the cure of it, replied the other anxiously. It is by going to some clever man over in Egdon Heath. They did not know if he was still alive, and I can't remember his name at this moment, but they said that you knew more of his movements than anybody else hereabout, and could tell me if he were still to be consulted. Dear me, what was his name? But you know. Not Conjurer Trendle, said her thin companion, turning pale. Trendle, yes. Is he still alive? I, I believe so, said Rhoda, with reluctance. Why do you call him Conjurer? Well, they say, they used to say he was a, he had powers other folk have not. Oh, how could my people be so superstitious as to recommend a man of that sort? I thought they meant some medical man. I shall think no more of him. Rhoda looked relieved, and Mrs. Lodge rode on. The milkwoman had inwardly seen, from the moment she heard of her having been mentioned as reference for this man, that there must exist a sarcastic feeling among the workfolk that a sorceress would know the whereabouts of the exorcist. They suspected her, then. A short time ago this would have given no concern to a woman of her common sense. But she had a haunting reason to be superstitious now, and she had been seized with a sudden dread that this conjurer Trendle might name her as the malignant influence which was blasting the fair person of Gertrude, 
and so lead her friend to hate her for ever, and to treat her as some fiend in human shape. But all was not over. Two days after, a shadow intruded into the window pattern thrown on Rhoda Brooks' floor by the afternoon sun. The woman opened the door at once, almost breathlessly. "'Are you alone?' said Gertrude. She seemed no less harassed and anxious than Brooke herself. "'Yes,' said Rhoda. "'The place in my arm seems worse and troubles me,' the young farmer's wife went on. "'It's so mysterious. I do hope it will not be an incurable wound. I have again been thinking of what they said about Conjurer Trendle. I don't really believe in such men, and I should not mind just visiting him from curiosity, though on no account must my husband know. Is it far to where he lives?' "'Yes, five miles,' said Rhoda backwardly, "'in the heart of Egdon. Well, I should have to walk. Could you not go with me to show me the way, say, to-morrow afternoon?' "'Oh, not I. That is—' the milkwoman murmured, with a start of dismay. Again the dread seized her that something to do with her fierce act in the dream might be revealed, and her character in the eyes of the most useful friend she had ever had be ruined irretrievably. Mrs. Lodge urged, and Rhoda finally assented, though with much misgiving. Sad as the journey would be to her, she could not consciously stand in the way of a possible remedy for her patron's strange affliction. It was agreed that, to escape suspicion of their mystic intent, they should meet at the edge of the heath, at the corner of a plantation which was just visible from the spot where they now stood. CHAPTER V. CONJURER TRENDLE By the next afternoon Rhoda would have done anything to escape this inquiry, but she had promised to go. Moreover, there was a horrid fascination at times of becoming instrumental in throwing such possible light in her own character, as would reveal to be something greater in the occult world than she had ever herself suspected. She started just before the time of day mentioned between them, and half hour's brisk walking brought her to the southeastern extension of the Egdon tract of country, where the fir plantation was. A slight figure, cloaked and veiled, was already there. Rhoda recognized, almost with a shudder, that Mrs. Lodge wore her left arm in a sling. They hardly spoke to each other, and immediately set out on their climb into the interior of the solemn country, which stood high above the rich alluvial soil they had left half an hour before. It was a long walk. Thick clouds made the atmosphere dark, though it was only as yet early afternoon, and the wind howled dismally over the hills of the heath not improbably the same heath which had witnessed the agony of the Wessex king's Ina, presented to the after-ages as Lear. Gertrude Lodge talked most, Rhoda replying with monosyllabic preoccupation. She had a strange dislike of walking on the side of her companion where hung the afflicted arm, moving round to the other when inadvertently near it. Much heather had been brushed by their feet when they descended upon a cart-track, beside which stood the house of the man they sought. He did not profess his remedial practices openly, or care anything about their continuance, his direct interests being those of a dealer in furs, turf, sharp sand, and other local products. Indeed, he affected not to believe largely in his own powers, and when warts that had been shown to him for cure miraculously disappeared, which it must be owned they infallibly did, he would say lightly, Oh, I only drink a glass of grog upon him, perhaps it's all chance, and immediately turn the subject. He was at home when they arrived, having, in fact, seen them descending into his valley. He was a grey-bearded man, with a reddish face, and he looked singularly at Rhoda the first moment he beheld her. Mrs. Lodge told him her errand, and then with words of self-disparagement he examined her arm. "'Medicine can't cure it,' he said promptly. "'Tis the work of an enemy.' Rhoda shrank into herself and drew back. "'An enemy? What enemy?' asked Mrs. Lodge. He shook his head. "'That's best known to yourself,' he said. "'If you like, I can show the person to you, "'though I shall not myself know who it is. "'I can do no more, and don't wish to do that.' "'She pressed him, on which he told Rhoda to wait outside where she stood, "'and took Mrs. Lodge into the room. "'It opened immediately from the door, "'and as the latter remained ajar, "'Rhoda Brooke could see the proceedings without taking part in them. "'He brought a tumbler from the dresser and nearly filled it with water.' and fetching an egg, prepared it in some private way, after which he broke it on the edge of the glass, so that the white went in and the yolk remained. As it was getting gloomy, he took the glass and its contents to the window, and told Gertrude to watch them closely. They leant over the table together, 
and the milkwoman could see the opaline hue of the egg fluid changing form as it sank in the water, but she was not near enough to define the shape that it assumed. "'Did you catch the likeness of any face or figure as you look?' demanded the conjurer of the young woman. She murmured a reply in tones so low as to be inaudible to Rhoda, and continued to gaze intently into the glass. Rhoda turned and walked a few steps away. When Mrs. Lodge came out and her face was met by the light, it appeared exceedingly pale, as pale as Rhoda's, against the sad dun shades of the upland's garniture. Trendle shut the door behind her, and at once they started homeward together. But Rhoda perceived that her companion had quite changed. "'Did he charge much?' she asked tentatively. "'Oh, no, nothing. He would not take a farthing,' said Gertrude. "'And what did you see?' inquired Rhoda. "'Nothing I care to speak of.' The constraint in her manner was remarkable. Her face was so rigid as to wear an oldened aspect, faintly suggestive of the face in Rhoda's bedchamber. "'Was it you who first proposed coming here?' Mrs. Lodge suddenly inquired after a long pause. "'How very odd, if you did.' "'No, but I am not sorry we have come, all things considered,' she replied. For the first time a sense of triumph possessed her, and she did not altogether deplore that the young thing at her side should learn that their lives had been antagonized by other influences than their own. The subject was no more alluded to during the long and dreary walk home, but in some way or other a story was whispered about the many dairied lowland that winter, that Mrs. Lodge's gradual loss of the use of her left arm was owing to her being overlooked by Rhoda Brooke. The latter kept her own counsel about the incubus, but her face grew sadder and thinner, and in the spring she and her boy disappeared from the neighbourhood of Homestoke. CHAPTER Six: A SECOND ATTEMPT Half a dozen years passed away, and Mr. and Mrs. Lodge's married experience sang into prosiness, and worse. The farmer was usually gloomy and silent, and the woman whom he had wooed for her grace and beauty was contorted and disfigured in the left limb. Moreover, she had brought him no child, which rendered it likely that he would be the last of a family who would occupy that valley for some two hundred years. He thought of Rhoda Brooke and her son, and feared that this might be a judgment from heaven upon him. The once blithe-hearted and enlightened Gertrude was changing into an irritable, superstitious woman, whose whole time was given to experimenting upon her ailment with every quack remedy she came across. She was honestly attached to her husband, and was ever secretly hoping against hope to win back his heart again by regaining some least of her personal beauty. Hence it arose that her closet was lined with bottles, packets, and ointment pots of every description, nay, bunches of mystic herbs, charms, and books of necromancy, which in her schoolgirl time she would have ridiculed as folly. "'Damned if you won't poison yourself with these apothecary messes and witch mixtures some time or other,' said her husband, when his eye chanced to fall upon the multitudinous array. She did not reply, but turned her sad, soft gaze upon him in such heart-swollen reproach that he looked sorry for his words, and added, "'I only meant it for your good, you know, Gertrude.' "'I'll clear out the whole lot and destroy them,' she said huskily, "'and try such remedies no more.' "'You want somebody to cheer you,' he observed. "'I once thought of adopting a boy, but he's too old now, "'and he's gone away I don't know where.' "'She guessed to whom he alluded, "'for Rhoda's Brook's story had in the course of years become known to her, "'though not a word had ever passed between her husband and herself on the subject. "'Neither had she ever spoken to him of her visit to Conjurer Trendle, and of what was revealed to her, or she thought was revealed to her, by that solitary heathman. She was now five and twenty, but she seemed older. Six years of marriage, and only a few months of love, she sometimes whispered to herself, and then she thought of the apparent cause, and said, with a tragic glance at her withering limb, If only I could again be as I was when he first saw me. She obediently destroyed her nostrums and charms, but there remained a hankering wish to try something else, some other sort of cure altogether. She had never visited Trendle since she had been conducted to the house of the solitary by Rhoda against her will, but now it suddenly occurred to Gertrude that she would, in a last desperate effort at deliverance from the seeming curse, again seek out the man, if he yet lived. He was entitled to a certain credence, 
for the indistinct form he had raised in the glass had undoubtedly resembled the only woman in the world who, as she now knew, though not then, could have a reason for bearing her ill will. The visit should be paid. This time she went alone, though she nearly got lost on the heath and roamed a considerable distance out of her way. Trundle's house was reached at last, however. He was not indoors, and instead of waiting at the cottage, she went to where his bent figure was pointed out to her at work, a long way off. Trundle remembered her, and laying down the handful of furze roots which he was gathering and throwing into a heap, he offered to accompany her in her homeward direction, as the distance was considerable and the days were short. So they walked together, his head bowed nearly to the earth, and his form of a colour with it. "'You can send away warts and other excrescences, I know,' she said. "'Why can't you send away this?' And the arm was uncovered. "'You think too much of my powers,' said Trundle. "'I'm old and weak now, too. "'No, no, it is too much for me to attempt in my own person. "'What have you tried?' She named to him some of the hundred medicaments and counterspells which she had adopted from time to time. He shook his head. "'Some were good enough,' he said approvingly, "'but not many of them for such as this.' This is of the nature of a blight, not of the nature of a wound, and if you could ever do throw it off, it will be all at once. If only I could. There is only one chance of doing it known to me. It has never failed in kindred afflictions, that I can declare. But it is hard to carry out, and especially for a woman. Tell me, said she, you must touch with the limb the neck of a man who has been hanged. She started a little at the image he had raised. Before he's cold, just after he's cut down, continued the conjurer impassively. How could that do good? It will turn the blood and change the constitution. But, as I say, to do it is hard. You must get into the jail and wait for him when he's brought off the gallows. Lots have done it, and perhaps not such pretty women as you. I used to send dozens for skin complaints, but that was in former times. The last I sent was in thirteen, near twenty years ago. He had no more to tell her, and when he had put her into a straight track homeward, he turned and left her, refusing all money, as at first. CHAPTER Seven, A RIDE The communication sank deep into Gertrude's mind. Her nature was rather a timid man, and probably of all remedies that the white wizard could have suggested, there was not one which had filled her with so much aversion as this, not to speak of the immense obstacles in the way of its adoption. Casterbridge, the county town, was a dozen or fifteen miles off, and in those days, when men were executed for horse-stealing, arson, and burglary, an assize seldom passed without a hanging, it was not likely that she could get access to the body of the criminal unaided, and the fear of her husband's anger made her reluctant to breathe a word of Trendle's suggestion to him or to anybody about him. She did nothing for months, and patiently bore her disfigurement as before. But her woman's nature, craving for renewed love, through the medium of renewed beauty, she was but twenty-five, was ever stimulating her to try what, at any rate, could hardly do her any harm. What came by a spell will go by a spell surely, she would say. Whenever her imagination pictured the act, she shrank in terror from the possibility of it. Then the words of the conjurer, it will turn your blood, were seen to be capable of a scientific no less than a ghastly interpretation. The mastering desire returned, and urged on her again. There was at this time but one county paper, and that her husband only occasionally borrowed. But old-fashioned days had old-fashioned means, and news was extensively conveyed by word of mouth from market to market, or from fair to fair, so that, whenever such an event such as an execution was about to take place, few within a radius of twenty miles were ignorant of the coming sight. And, so far as Holmstoke was concerned, some enthusiasts had been known to walk all the way to Casterbridge and back in one day, solely to witness the spectacle. The next assizes were in March, and when Gertrude Lodge heard that they had been held, she inquired stealthily at the inn as to the result, as soon as she could find the opportunity. She was, however, too late. The time at which the sentences were to be carried out had arrived, and to make the journey and obtain admission at such short notice required at least her husband's assistance. She dared not tell him, for she had found by delicate experiment that these smouldering village beliefs made him furious if mentioned, partly because he half entertained them himself. 
it was therefore necessary to wait for another opportunity. Her determination received a fillet from learning that two epileptic children had attended from this very village of Holmstoke many years before with beneficial results, though the experiment had been strongly condemned by the neighboring clergy. April, May, June passed, and as it is no overstatement to say that by the end of the last named month Gertrude well nigh longed for the death of a fellow creature. Instead of her formal prayers each night, her unconscious prayer was, O oh Lord, hang some guilty or innocent person soon. This time she made earlier inquiries, and was altogether more systematic in her proceedings. Moreover, the season was summer, between the haymaking and the harvest, and in the leisure thus afforded him, her husband had been holiday-taking away from home. The assizes were in July, and she went to the inn as before. There was to be one execution, only one, for arson. Her greatest problem was not how to get to Casterbridge, but by what means she should adopt for obtaining admission to the jail. Though access for such purposes had formerly never been denied, the custom had fallen into desuetude, and in contemplating her possible difficulties, she was again almost driven to fall back upon her husband. But, on sounding him about the assizes, he was so uncommunicative, so more than usually cold, that she did not proceed, and decided that whatever she did, she would do alone. Fortune, obdurate hitherto, showed her unexpected favour. On the Thursday before the Saturday fixed for the execution, Lodge remarked to her that he was going away from home for another day or two on business at a fair, and that he was sorry he could not take her with him. She exhibited on this occasion so much readiness to stay at home that he looked at her in surprise. Time had been when she would have shown deep disappointment at the loss of such a jaunt. However, he lapsed into his usual taciturnity, and on the day named left Holmstoke. It was now her turn. She had first thought of driving, but on reflection how that driving would not do, since it would necessitate her keeping to the turnpike road, and so increase by tenfold the risk of her ghastly errand being found out. She decided to ride and avoid the beaten track, notwithstanding that in her husband's stables there was no animal just at present by which any stretch of imagination could be considered a lady's mount, in spite of his promise before marriage to always keep a mare for her. He had, however, many cart-horses, fine ones of their kind, and among the rest was a serviceable creature, an equine Amazon, with a back as broad as a sofa, on which Gertrude had occasionally taken an airing when unwell. This horse she chose. On Friday afternoon one of the men brought it round. She was dressed, and before going down looked at her shriveled arm. Ah, she said to it, if it had not been for you this terrible ordeal would have been saved me. When strapping up the bundle in which she carried a few articles of clothing, she took occasion to say to the servant, I take this in case I should not get back tonight from the person I am going to visit. Don't be alarmed if I am not in by ten, and close up the house as usual. I shall be at home tomorrow for certain. She meant then to privately tell her husband the deed accomplished was not like the deed projected. He would almost certainly forgive her. And then the pretty palpitating Gertrude Lodge went from her husband's homestead, but though her goal was Casterbridge, she did not take the direct route directly through Stickleford. Her cunning course was first in precisely the opposite direction. As soon as she was out of sight, however, she turned to the left, by a road which led to Egton, and on entering the heath wheeled around and set out on the true course, due westerly. A more private way down the county could not be imagined. And as to direction, she had merely to keep her horse's head to a point little to the right of the sun. She knew that she would light upon a furze cut or a cottager of some sort from time to time, from whom she might correct her bearing. Though the date was comparatively recent, Egdon was much less fragmentary in character than now. The attempts, successful and otherwise, at cultivation on the lower slopes, which intrude and break up to the original heath into small detached heaths, had not been carried far. Enclosure acts had not taken effect, and the banks and fences which now exclude the cattle of those villagers who formerly enjoyed rights of commonage thereon, and the carts of those who had turbary privileges, which kept them in firing all the year round, were not erected. Gertrude, therefore, rode along with no other obstacles than the prickly firs bushes, the mats of heather, the white water courses, and the natural steeps and declivities of the ground. 
Her horse was sure, if heavy-footed and slow, and though a draught animal, was easy-paced. Had it been otherwise, she was not a woman who could have ventured to ride over such a bit of country with a half-dead arm. It was therefore nearly eight o'clock when she drew rein to breathe the mare on the last outlying high point of heathland towards Casterbridge, previous to leaving Egdon for the cultivated valleys. She halted before a pool called Rushy Pond, flanked by the ends of two hedges. A railing ran through the centre of the pond, but dividing it in half. Over the railing she saw the low green country, over the green trees the roofs of the town, over the roofs a white flat façade denoting the entrance to the county jail. On the roof of this front specks were moving about. They seemed to be workmen erecting something. Her flesh crept. She descended slowly and was soon amid cornfields and pastures. In another half-hour, when it was almost dusk, Gertrude reached the White Hart, the first inn of the town on that side. Little surprise was excited by her arrival. Farmers' wives rode on horseback more than they do now, though, for that matter, Mrs. Lodge was not imagined to be a wife at all. The innkeeper supposed her to be some harem scaring young woman who had come to attend the hang fair next day. Neither her husband nor herself had ever dealt in Casterbridge Market, so that she was unknown. While dismounting, she beheld a crowd of boys standing at the door of a harness-maker's shop, just above the inn, looking inside it with deep interest. "'What's going on there?' she asked of the ostler, making the rope for to-morrow. She throbbed responsively, and contracted her arm. "'Tis sold by the inch afterwards,' the man continued. "'I could get you a bit, miss, for nothing, if you'd like.' She hastily repudiated any such wish, all the more from a curious creeping feeling that the condemned wretch's destiny was becoming interwoven with her own, and having engaged a room for the night, sat down to think. Up to this time she had formed but the vaguest notions about her means of attaining access to the prison. The words of the cunning man returned to her mind. He had implied that she should use her beauty, impaired though it was, as a pass-key. In her inexperience, she knew little about jail functionaries. She had heard of a high sheriff and an under-sheriff, but dimly only. She knew, however, there must be a hangman, and to the hangman she determined to apply. CHAPTER Eight: A WATERSIDE HERMIT At this date, and for several years afterward, there was a hangman to almost every jail. Gertrude found, on inquiry, that the Casterbridge official— dwelt in a lonely cottage by a deep, slow river flowing under the cliff on which the prison buildings were situate, the stream being the self-same one, though she did not know it, which watered the Stickleford and Holmstoke meads lower down in its course. Having changed her dress before she had eaten or drunk, for she could not take her ease until she had ascertained some particulars, Gertrude pursued her way by a path along the waterside to the cottage indicated. Passing thus the outskirts of the jail, she discerned on the level roof over the gateway three rectangular lines against the sky, where the specks had been moving in her distant view. She recognized what the erection was, and quickly passed on. Another hundred yards brought her to the executioner's house, where a boy pointed out it stood close to the same stream, and was hard by a weir, the waters of which emitted a steady roar. While she stood hesitating, the door opened, and an old man came forth, shading a candle with one hand. Locking the door on the outside, he turned to a flight of wooden steps fixed against the end of the cottage, and began to ascend them, this being evidently the staircase to his bedroom. Gertrude hastened forward, but by the time she reached the foot of the ladder, he was at the top. She called to him loudly enough to be heard above the roar of the weir. He looked down and said, "'What do you want here?' "'To speak to you a minute.' The candle, such as it was, fell on her imploring, pale, upturned face, and Davies, as the hangman was called, back down the ladder. "'I was just going to bed,' he said, "'early to bed and early to rise, but I don't mind stopping a minute for such a one as you. Come into the house.' He reopened the door and preceded her to the room within. The implements of his daily work— which is that of a jobbing gardener, stood in a corner, and seeing probably that she looked rural, he said, "'If you want me to undertake county work, I can't come, for I never leave Casterbridge for the gentle nor simple, not I. My real calling is officer of justice,' he added formally. "'Yes, yes, that's it. Tomorrow.' "'Ah, I thought so. What's the matter about that? Tis no use to come here about the knot. Folks do come continually, but I tell em one knot is as merciful as another if you keep ye under the ear.' 
is the unfortunate man a relation, or should I say, perhaps, looking at her dress, a person who's been in your employ? No. What time is the execution? The same as usual. Twelve o'clock, or as soon after as the London mail coach gets in. We always wait for that in case of a reprieve. Oh, a reprieve! I hope not, she said involuntarily. Well, he he, as a matter of business, so do I. But still, if every young man deserved to be let off, this one does. Only just turned eighteen, and only present by chance when the rick was fired. Howsomever, that's not so much risk of it, as they are obliged to make an example of him, there having been so much destruction of property that way lately. I mean, she explained, that I want to touch him for a charm, a cure of an affliction, by the advice of a man who has proved the virtue of a remedy. Oh, yes, miss, now I understand. I had such people come in past years. But it didn't strike me that you looked disordered to require blood-turning. What's the complaint? The wrong kind for this, I'll be bound. My arm. She reluctantly showed the withered arm. Ah, tis all a scram, said the hangman, examining it. Yes, said she. Well, he continued with interest, that is a class of subject I'm bound to admit. I like the look of the place. It's truly as suitable for the cure as I ever saw. "'Twas a knowing man that sent he, whoever he was. "'You can contrive for me all that's necessary?' she asked breathlessly. "'You really should have gone to the governor of the jail and Dr. Withy, "'given your name and address. "'That's how it used to be done, if I recollect. "'Still, perhaps, maybe I can manage it for a trifling fee. "'Oh, thank you. "'I would rather do it this way, as I should like it kept private. "'Lover not to know, eh? "'No, husband. "'Aha. Uh, very well. "'I'll get thee a touch of the corpse.' "'Where is it now?' she asked, shuddering. "'It. He, you mean. He's living yet. "'Just inside that small window up there in the glum. "'He signified the jail and the cliff above. "'She thought of her husband and her friends. "'Yes, of course,' she said. "'And how am I to proceed?' "'He took her to the door. "'Now do you be waiting at the little wicket in the wall "'that you find up there in the lane, not later than one o'clock. "'I will open it to thee from the inside, "'as I shan't come home to dinner until he's cut down. "'Good night.' "'Be punctual, and if you don't want anybody to know, you wear a veil. "'Ah, once I had a daughter such as you.' "'She went away and climbed the path above, "'to assure herself that she would be able to find the wicket next day. "'Its outline was soon visible to her, "'a narrow opening in the outer wall of the prison precincts. "'The steep was so great that, having reached the wicket, "'she stopped a moment to breathe, "'and looking back on the water cot, "'saw the hangman again ascending his outdoor staircase.' He entered the lofty chamber to which it led, and in a few minutes extinguished his light. The town clock struck ten, and she returned to the White Hart as she had come. CHAPTER Nine: A RENCOUNTER It was one o'clock on Saturday. Gertrude Lodge, having been admitted to the jail as above described, was sitting in a waiting-room within the second gate, which stood under a classic archway of Ashler, then comparatively modern, and bearing the inscription, County Jail, 1793. This had been the façade she saw from the heath the day before. Near at hand was a passage to the roof on which the gallows stood. The town was thronged and the market suspended, but Gertrude had seen scarcely a soul. Having kept her room to the hour of the appointment, she had proceeded to the spot by a way which avoided the open space below the cliff where the spectators had gathered, but she could, even now, hear the multitudinous babble of their voices, out of which rose at intervals the hoarse croak of a single voice uttering the words, Last dying speech and confession. There had been no reprieve, and the execution was over, but the crowd still waited to see the body taken down. Soon the persistent girl heard a trampling overhead, then a hand beckoned to her, and following directions she went out and crossed the inner paved court beyond the gatehouse, her knees trembling so she could scarcely walk. One of her arms was out of its sleeve, and only covered by her shawl. On the spot at which he had now arrived were two trestles, and before she could think of their purpose, she heard heavy feet descending stairs somewhere at her back. Turn her head she would not, or could not, and rigid in this position, she was conscious of a rough coffin passing her shoulder, borne by four men. It was open, and in it lay the body of a young man, wearing the smock frock of a rustic and fustian breeches. The corpse had been thrown into the coffin so hastily that the skirt of the smock frock was hanging over. The burden was temporarily deposited on the trestles. 
By this time the young woman's state was such that a grey mist seemed to float before her eyes, on account of which, in the veil she wore, she could scarcely discern anything. It was as though she had nearly died, but was held up by a sort of galvanism. Now, said a voice close at hand, and she was just conscious that the word had been addressed to her. By a last strenuous effort she advanced, at the same time hearing persons approaching behind her. She bared her poor cursed arm, and Davies, uncovering the face of the corpse, took Gertrude's hand and held it so that her arm lay across the dead man's neck, upon a line the colour of an unripe blackberry which surrounded it. Gertrude shrieked. The turn of the blood, predicted by the conjurer, had taken place. But at that moment a second shriek rent the air of the enclosure. It was not Gertrude's, and its effect upon her was to make her start round. Immediately behind her stood Rhoda Brooke, her face drawn and her eyes red with weeping. Behind Rhoda stood Gertrude's own husband, his countenance lined, his eyes dim, but without a tear. You! What are you doing here? he said hoarsely. Hussy! To come between us and our child now, cried Rhoda. This is the meaning of what Satan showed me in the vision. You are like her at last! And clutching the bare arm of the younger woman, she pulled her unresistingly back against the wall. Immediately Brooke had loosened her hold, the fragile young Gertrude slid down against the feet of her husband. When he lifted her up, she was unconscious. The mere sight of the twain had been enough to suggest to her that the dead young man was Rhoda's son. At that time the relatives of an executed convict had the privilege of claiming the body for burial if they chose to do so, and it was for this purpose that Lodge was awaiting the inquest with Rhoda. He had been summoned by her as soon as the young man was taken into the crime, and at different times since, and he had attended in court during the trial. This was the holiday he had been indulging in of late. The two wretched parents had wished to avoid exposure, and hence had come themselves for the body, a wagon and sheet for its conveyance, covering being in waiting outside. Gertrude's case was so serious that it was deemed advisable to call to her the surgeon who was at hand. She was taken out of the jail into the town, but she never reached home alive. Her delicate vitality, sapped perhaps by the paralyzed arm, collapsed under the double shock that followed the severe strain, physical and mental, to which she had subjected herself during the previous twenty-four hours. Her blood had been turned, indeed, too far. Her death took place in the town three days after. Her husband was never seen in Casterbridge again, once only in the old marketplace at Anglebury, which he had so much frequented, and very seldom in public anywhere. Burdened at first with moodiness and remorse, he eventually changed for the better, and appeared as a chastened and thoughtful man. Soon after attending the funeral of his poor young wife, he took steps towards giving up the farms in Homestoke and the adjoining parish, and having sold every head of his stock, he went away to Port Brady, at the other end of the county, living there in solitary lodgings until his death two years later of a painless decline. It was then found that he had bequeathed the whole of his not inconsiderable property to a reformatory for boys, subject to the payment of a small annuity to Rhoda Brooke, if she could be found to claim it. For some time she could not be found, but eventually she reappeared in her old parish, absolutely refusing, however, to have anything to do with the provision made for her. Her monotonous milking at the dairy was resumed, and followed for many long years, until her form became bent, and her once abundant dark hair white and worn away at the forehead, perhaps by long pressure against the cows. Here sometimes, those who knew her experiences would stand and observe her, and wonder what sombre thoughts were beating inside that impassive wrinkled brow, to the rhythm of alternating milk streams. End of the Withered Arm by Thomas Hardy